Hello everyone, Kevin from TechSelect here. Just wanted to do a quick video on the hardware changes between the first prototype and the second prototype of the Commander X16. Currently the emulator is still laid out based on the first prototype, except for the Vera, which is actually similar to the second prototype. But there are a few key changes that programmers will need to be aware of as the emulator eventually catches up with the second prototype. The IO address range is really one of the key changes from the first prototype to the second. The chart below spells it all out, but as you can see, the main differences involve the new sound chips and the removal of some old components that we no longer need. We went ahead and took this opportunity to rearrange things to where it made a little bit more sense, uh, putting the Vias in as the first I.O. device. The Vera stayed where it was, and now the third device was actually originally used for both sound chips and the real-time clock. And you may have noticed that the SAA 1099 and the real-time clock are crossed out. So the real-time clock's not actually gone. We're just moving it to a different device, and this was mostly as a cost-saving measure. The original RTC was the DS12885, which is a nice chip. It's parallel, a little weird to work with, but we decided that the cost of that chip's just a little bit too high, around $6 each. And looking at some of the I2C chips, you can get those much cheaper, and we found one that's around $0.80 cents each. Uh, and it's really simple to interface with the VIA. So there's really no reason uh, to put that other chip on there. So we went ahead and moved that. So it's not really gone. It's just actually connected to the first uh, IO range through a VIA. And there'll be routines in basic to access the chip without having to access it directly. Uh, that's something they're gonna work on. Um, also that freed up five uh, expansion ranges for the IO bus. So my idea was really uh, you know, you could obviously tie a card to a specific range if you wish, or you could use a jumper and use multiple ones on a single card if you wanted to, and now you just have one more available. One of the key differences between the first and the second prototype are the way RAM and ROM banking behave. On the original prototype, we used pins from Avia to drive the RAM and ROM banking. And while this worked rather well, it was costly to waste all of those pins on this function. So we decided while working on the second board it would be nice to actually use a zero page address to latch the RAM and ROM banks. Now, any write to address zero or address one will latch the according RAM or ROM bank. One of the other changes is that the ROM size has increased uh, from 128k to 512k. I did this because I had more pins available to go ahead and drive a larger space. And actually I have three pins left over as well which could theoretically allow you to drive as much as two megabytes of ROM or you could run 512k of ROM and say a meg and a half of RAM, you would have to bank completely out of ROM to access that RAM if you wanted to do it that way, but I'm gonna probably leave a pin header on the board where someone could connect an additional, say, you know, ROM or RAM space there if they wanted to. Now that the RAM and ROM banking have been changed to no longer use the vias, we have all but two pins free on the second chip. I call this the user port slash printer port because it's actually set up to work the same way as a PC printer port would as far as pinouts concerned. Since we're using an ATX form factor, it only made sense to use this type of a connector. So a standard PC printer connector will work on this case. Basically, I've set this port up to where you can use it for anything that you like. And if desired, you could bit bang the pins and control a printer, control a zip drive, or anything else that used a Centronic style printer port back in the day. In the diagram, you'll see that there are three jumpers. On a standard printer port, pins 20, 22, and 24 would typically be a ground, and if you're going to use a device which is a printer port type device, you need to have those grounded. I went ahead and put an optional connector for CB1 and CB2 on pins 20 and 22. I thought maybe you would need to access those if you were using it more like a user port, and likewise, there's no power on a standard LPT printer port. And pin 24 raises a question, it's probably going to be a bad idea to do that, and I'm likely going to remove it and make that pin a ground permanently. The upside to that is you can't accidentally short the computer out uh, by plugging in, say, a printer that's grounding those pins naturally. Uh, the downside to that is there will be no 5-volt line accessible from the user port. And I'm trying to think of a good way to address that, maybe putting a port um, on the back of the machine that you could plug a barrel jack into or something to that effect. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer just yet for that, but I really feel like leaving a jumper there is just inviting a short, so probably going to remove J14 there and just make that a ground. 
There are a few issues that I'm running into with power. The first prototype was just connected directly to a barrel jack and didn't even have a power switch. It was just turned off and on externally. But on this one, I knew we would be moving to the ATX form factor, micro ATX case. So I wanted to go ahead and start working on the circuit for power on uh, soft start for the ATX. I built several different designs on a breadboard. Originally, I just used a 555 and I made a circuit or two work, but I always felt like it just wasn't debouncing the way that I liked. So I decided I would use a 555 to latch a flip flop. And honestly, it didn't work a heck of a lot better, but it did seem to be a little bit more stable. And I decided, you know, I'd played around with it for a couple of days and I, I thought I would just try this one out. And honestly, it works fairly well. And at first I thought it was working fine. The first power supply I used, it turned on and off just as you would expect. Uh, it did act a little weird if you held the button kind of half in and out. It would repeat, uh, turn the power off and on, which is something I was actually trying to avoid uh, with the circuit. But then uh, when I had some other people working on the board, they noticed that it just immediately came on whenever they powered on the power supply. And I thought that was a little strange, and I tried a couple of other power supplies, and sure enough, some of mine are doing that too. So I'm going to try to address that in a few ways, but ultimately I'm looking for a better circuit here. I want, you know, everything has to be a TTL design, has to be through-hole chips, um, can't use a microcontroller, which is probably what would be the best approach to, uh, to make this work, you know, rock solid, but I need a TTL type of circuit here that'll turn the power off and on for an ATX supply cleanly. And I'm going to test some more out, but this is something that's kind of an issue. And another elephant in the room that I haven't really addressed and not sure what the best approach is for this either is now that we're using an ATX power supply, I'm inviting someone to plug a 950 watt Corsair power supply into this board and perform some pretty incredible arc welding across the pins, uh, frying traces on the board and all that kind of fun stuff. So currently there's pretty much no current limiting. I use a small Pico ATX power supply when I do my testing, but you know, there's nothing to stop someone from plugging in a giant supply. And that's something that, you know, I'm going to need to address by either putting some sort of a power supply on the board, which would limit the current. Um, you know, anything is going to be a large component and with an unknown power source, how large of a component do I need without using some sort of a regulator? So anyway, that's, an issue because I don't want to generate a lot of heat and I don't want to generate a lot of noise with a, you know, bucking supply or anything like that. But we'll have to see, you know, there's something there that also needs to be addressed, but just something else we got to work out before the end. I know a lot of people are probably going to be upset, but we have decided to drop the SAA 1099 officially. We've talked about this off and on for the past several months, even as we had problems working through the prototype. The, the reality is the Vera can just run circles around it. I mean, there's lots I could say that, uh, you know, we'd originally designed the system to where the video card would be replaceable. And that way the sound, you know, would be built into the system and we wouldn't lose the PSG sound whenever we switched to a different video card. However, as the kernel development's gone on, it's pretty clear that the operating system is very heavily tied to the way the Vera functions. And, 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 you know, inextricably the way the system's designed, the Vera is pretty necessary. So removing it would, would mean just a rewrite of the kernel in a pretty extensive way. So I feel like it's fairly unlikely anyone's going to do that. And as a result, it's now officially part of the sound system. And as a result of that, we just don't need the SAA anymore. So the last thing I wanted to show is what these code changes would mean to someone's application. And, and honestly, they're very minimal. And in fact, I know very little about assembly language in general. I'm not particularly good at it. I can muddle through, but I was able to go and look at the source code that Slithy Matt wrote for Chase Vault. This is a game I actually wanted to run uh, in my first video, uh, or I guess not my first one, but the last video, but I wasn't able to get it to run on the hardware. But I went back and he does have the source code out on GitHub and I thought I'd take a stab at just recompiling it and seeing if I could get it to run and lo and behold, I was able to get it to work. But I thought I would just show real quick what the changes are in the code to make it work from the old hardware to the new, uh, just to give you an idea of what you're gonna have to change and honestly, it's fairly straightforward. I pulled up Matt's source code for Chase Vault here on GitHub and I just wanted to show you real quick a few things. This is the unaltered code and, and right here, uh, 
you know, you can see he's using some zero page registers. And this one's a problem. Uh, we're using zero, zero. And I know in the documentation it says zero, zero, I believe to seven F or open for user variables. Uh, we're going to have to change that, of course, now that the RAM and ROM banking are using zero, zero, and zero, one. Uh, this is not going to be okay anymore. So you'll have to change anything that's using that register or that uh, memory address. Uh, likewise, moving down here, the RAM and the ROM bank, uh, as well as the YM location, have changed. So let me go over uh, and do this. And I'll just change it in the source code here. I've actually already changed it. So this was the zero page address that was pointing to zero, zero. I just changed it to 70 because I didn't look through all of his code and make sure nothing else was using anything. I thought just put it out of range there or something high. Uh, so the RAM and the ROM bank, as I said, just simply changing those to zero and zero one and also changed these two guys right here. So I'll just write it and get out of here. And now I'm just build it and should be in here now. Yep, there she is. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop this and go over and move it to the commander.